Hi, my name is Dr. Abdul Manan, Medical Director at Blue Peanut. In this video, I'm going to talk to you about medical ethics. What is medical ethics? The principles of medical ethics. We'll cover all of that in this video. First of all, it's very important to recognize that medical ethics is all about moral principles. Moral principles by which doctors, dentists, healthcare professionals, we all have to behave, we all have to understand and adhere to during dispensation in our practice. So what are those principles? It's important to realize that those very principles are not necessarily the same all the time. Take for example the ethics around abortion for example or the ethics around euthanasia. As you can understand things are not the same today as they used to be 30 years ago. 30 years ago we had certain rules about um, euthanasia, we had certain rules about abortion Nowadays, it's very different. So what are those principles? What are those ethical principles that you need to know about? Well, very briefly, there's four ethical principles you need to know about. Number one, beneficence. Number two, autonomy. Number three, non-maleficence. And number four, justice. So let's now look at each one of those, elaborate and understand each one in detail. So beneficence, let's look at beneficence as a principle, right? So beneficence in essence means that a doctor, a healthcare professional has a moral duty to do good for their patients, right? It's as simple as that. However, if we understand it in its simplistic form, I don't think we're doing it the justice that it deserves. Let me explain. When you look at the benefit, the beneficence for your patient, you need to tailor it to that person's needs. What may benefit one person may not benefit another person. So I often talk to my students and I explain to them that I always think about options. So to, for example, treat somebody's male pattern baldness, there may be different ways of doing it. You need to look at what would suit the needs of that person. If it's medicinal, for example, is that the right thing to do for your patient? Will it interact, for example, with medication that person's already on? Or perhaps um, the kidneys aren't functioning well. So is that the right approach for this patient? It may be for your next patient and your patient after for the same problem, you may need to look at an entirely different solution. So beneficence does not necessarily mean the same thing for everybody. I hope you understand what I mean by beneficence now. So the next principle you need to think about is autonomy. What does autonomy mean? Well, in simplistic terms, it means a patient has the right to make their own decisions. A patient must be able to think about, process and make their own decisions. That also means that you should not kind of push them in that direction. You should not interfere in that decision making process. The only form of interference, or shall I say, joint decision making you should think about is advising your patient, is giving all the necessary information that's required by your patient so that they can make an informed choice, an informed decision. That's the only involvement you should have in the process. Of course, it gets a bit more complicated. For example, if a patient is unable to make a decision, if a patient has someone else who makes the decision for them, because in those situations, you have to navigate that different situation. So for example, if a person's relative is making their decision, you're going to have to involve them in that decision-making process. If, for example, a patient isn't able to make any decisions and they don't have anybody else to advocate for them, to represent them, to be their attorney, then you have to think about doing it yourself as the medical practitioner. So you may have to act in the best interest yourself and involve perhaps others around you as a multidisciplinary team. Our third pillar is non-maleficence. So what does non-maleficence mean? Well, in essence, non-maleficence means not to do any harm. Okay, sometimes we refer to this pillar as the sister pillar to beneficence.
Whenever we look at beneficence and consider beneficence, we almost always have to consider non-maleficence as well. Some would say that non-maleficence is the opposite of beneficence. Beneficence meaning to do what's of benefit to your patients and non-maleficence meaning not to do any harm. So some would actually say they are the opposites. I would argue that they're not entirely the opposites. So for example, beneficence is looking at what's beneficial for your patient. Beneficence does not have to be the same for your two patients. As I described earlier, it could be that you take two different approaches in benefiting your patients. So beneficence is entirely looking at benefiting your patient, not necessarily looking at any thresholds. Non-maleficence, however, introduces the concept of threshold, i.e. if you're about to do something good for your patient, some treatment process, what non-maleficence does, it sets a threshold so that your beneficence does not end up potentially harming your patient or knowingly harm your patient. So you might go out to do good for your patient by doing an operation, but actually you find that the risk of damaging or hurting or doing bad to your patient is just too much, too high a risk. So non-maleficence will kick in and stop that from going ahead. The other differentiation, the other difference I would suggest, or um, how you would kind of distinguish between non-maleficence and the issue of beneficence would be to look at non-maleficence as a constant. Whereas beneficence can be different to different people, the constant with non-maleficence is that, for example, if you see somebody collapse in front of you, an emergency situation, you are duty bound as a doctor, as a healthcare professional, to go and provide help. You do not have a choice in the matter, you must help. So can you see what I mean by that? Last but not least, let's look at the last pillar of medical ethics, and that is justice. So what does justice mean? Well, we need to think about justice in the medical sense. It has some bearings and some relationship with the legal sense of justice, in the sense that in medical justice, ethical justice, we need to think about what is allowed by law and what isn't allowed by law. So for example, um, you might have a patient wishing to commit euthanasia. Somebody wants to die. Well, as you know, as I speak in the UK, that is currently illegal and you cannot take part in that process. Even if the patient uh, causes their own death, it is an illegal matter and you cannot take any part in that. Even though you might feel medically there may be um, some benefit in doing that. There may be uh, a reason to end their suffering for example. But at the moment as things stand, no matter how medically um, you feel it must should be done, legally you will not be covered and you will feel fo uh, fall foul of rules. So it's about weighing up legal justice and medical justice and marrying the two together. So that's the first part of justice. The second part of justice, of course, is that we, as healthcare professionals, we must be blind. Blind, what do I mean by that? Do I mean that physically? Well, no, perhaps not. Metaphorically, perhaps. And what I mean by that is, you need to be blind to a person's culture, a person's religion, a person's status in society, a person's gender, a person's sexual orientation, um, you know, where they're from. We need to be blind to all of that and we need to treat our patients fairly. And that is why, that is one of the reasons why the NHS has an established charter. That is why it has certain rules. For example, nobody um, is prioritised for surgery um, save the reason for the surgery. So um, if you have 10 patients on a waiting list for hip surgery, they will get prioritized based on need, based on their medical need, as opposed to their social standing or their gender, etc., etc. Um, another example could be, for example, um, in, in the NHS, we treat patients who need expensive treatments. So for example, cancer treatment. A very small number of patients get a large amount of resource uh, 
thrown at them in terms of chemotherapy, radiotherapy. These are all very expensive treatments. So on the one side, you've got a small bunch of people benefiting from very expensive treatments. And on the other hand, you can argue that this large amount of money resource could be used to look after people with smaller problems, more trivial problems, and therefore benefit a lot more people. And the counter argument to that would be, actually, if you intervene and if you look after people with cancer earlier on, then you will save costs later on with other things going wrong. In a similar way, you might intervene early with other problems so that that problem does not kind of fester and become a bigger problem for society. So there's always these counter arguments and balances you have to look at, but overall we still have to maintain the principle of fairness across society. Music